This episode is brought to you by Airbnb. Hi, Pashi. Hi, Sufi. It's Thanksgiving week. I know. So exciting. This is very exciting. When this airs, it will be a day before we tape our family episode yeah. of Late Night with you and mom. I'm excited. I don't know uh, what you've got in store for us this year or if there is anything in store. Yeah, we, you know, I feel like the years where we've had too much in store, it has gone less well than the years where we just sort of have fun. But maybe we should try to have at least something in store for us. Yeah. Well, we'll think about that. Do you like showing up and having something in store for you? Yeah, I don't I don't know. Uh, sometimes, yes. I feel like we've done some fun things in the past. We did, like, I remember there was a back in my day that was fun to have mom and dad. That's true. Uh, doing a sketch. They're not bad sketch actors. And now that the uh, Screen Actors Guild strike is essentially over, it's feeling like, I feel like between when we're recording this and done, I think it's all going to be ratified and good. So mom and dad maybe can lean on their SAG cards a bit more. Yeah, that's right. They had real solidarity for uh, the work stoppage, mom and dad. <laughs> they would just pick it around the cul-de-sac that we grew up on. Uh, hey, I had a cool night out. I had sort of a double date with Jeff Tweedy. Ooh. He was a uh, guest on our show uh, promoting his new book, uh, which is lovely, and I highly recommend. It's his third book. Uh, this one is about 50 songs that influenced him. It sort of reads like an essay collection, and it's really great. He's a very good writer. He's a very funny uh-huh. writer. He's a very thoughtful writer. That's not surprising, I think, for anybody who listens to Wilco. So he's yeah. on my show, and he came out, and he sat at the desk. And I'm paraphrasing here, but I basically said, hey, before we get started, I want to thank you for doing the theme song to uh, for our podcast. And he's sure. like, oh, yeah, yeah, He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I said, uh, do, you, do you remember you did that? He was like, no, I hadn't. I didn't remember. <laughs> Wait. That's not top of mind for Tweety? That's not top of mind. And then he said, oh, uh, wait, someone just yesterday said they really liked it. I was like, oh, that's nice. Are you telling the truth? And he was like, no. He's very funny. <laughs> and then the second half of our double date, we, uh, we went out and uh, I moderated a book event with him in Jersey City, which was a lovely event. And it was Q&A from the audience. Um, and when it was over, he said, uh, oh, it's so weird. None of the questions were about the podcast song. <laughs> <laughs> he said that to you or to the audience? To me. Okay, just to Just you. burning me on how little this counts in his uh, his oeuvre of great work. Yeah. I went and saw Amy Poehler and Tina Fey's show. Wow. At the Yamava Resort and Casino out here. And it was so fun. Those, That's great. Those women are so funny. But I, I got stopped afterwards and they were like, hey, you're Josh Myers from the podcast. And the... Uh, I was with our friend Liz, and she was like, well, that's nice that you get a podcast recognition. Was that your first podcast uh, stop in person? Uh, No, there was another one that was even better, I would say, because I was walking my dog, Woody, and a guy that lives in the neighborhood. I walked by, and we just sort of like nod at each other the way you do. We both had headphones in, and then he sort of like flagged me down. And I turned back, and he showed me on his phone he was listening to the podcast. That's really good. That's yeah. really good. When it's authentic, that's really good. Yeah. You mentioned Woody. And I should note, Axel, I think it's playful. I think it's more playful than than mean. But you have a new dog named Woody, and every time you talk to my middle son, Axel, he asks, where's Pickles? <laughs> right. When Pickles has died a year ago. Yeah, Pickles was my dog, my heart and soul for 18 and a half years. I can't, I can't be mad that Pickles is gone. I'm sad about it, sure. Yeah. And then had about a year, a year gap between losing Pickles and getting Woody. And in the interim, and just, you know, for a while now, I've also we've had Debbie the dog. Yeah. Um, but Woody is very reminiscent of Pickles. He's totally his own dog. And Axel, I don't know if he met Pickles, but we would just be on Facetime together. Yeah, he saw Pickles a lot on Facetime. He's trying, I think, to keep Pickles' memory alive by asking every time he sees you where he is. But here's the crazy thing. I was telling a story to the boys this morning on the walk to school about the house we grew up in, the house mom and dad still live in. And I was trying to explain what our driveway looked like. And I realized, oh, I'll just go on Google Maps, right? Oh, yeah. And Street View will show, have you looked at our house on Google Maps, Street View? I have. It's amazing. And did you see the dog? Yes. The dog's Plural. I guess when the, the Google truck or whatever it is it drove by, the dogs ran out to see the car. 
Because they chase every car that drives around that cul de sac. So is it Daisy and Albert? Yes. It must be Daisy, right? Yeah. So Daisy was our great Pyrenees who is uh, also passed away. And I'm showing this to the boys, and all of a sudden, I mean, I can't believe on the Google Street View, there's yeah. this, these two long dead dogs. Let's point out they they both have passed away. Albert and yeah. this version of Albert. Anyway, we pan over it. Axel goes, huh? "Is that Daisy?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yes." And he goes, huh? "She's alive." And I'm like, "No, <laughs> she's not alive." And by the way, this is, makes perfect sense that he's confused. And he goes, "Oh, is that her tombstone?" And that's the best thing about Axel is that he thinks a dog's tombstone would look like the dog. (laughs) Well, there is like, I go to the Hollywood Forever Cemetery a lot yeah, uh, because they show movies there. It's one of my favorite things to do through the summer. There's this organization, Cinespe, and they show movies on the side of this mausoleum. And it's, you're not standing on graves that people always have a great concern that like, I don't want to stand on graves or sit on graves and you're not. Yeah. But a lot of those tombstones, I feel like it was like a cultural thing. A lot of those tombstones have like very lifelike pictures of the people on them. They're not carved into like human form the way Axel would maybe imagine this was done for Daisy. But it's an interesting take, I think, to have a like photo likeness of yourself etched on a tombstone. Yeah. I think also you have to plan ahead and pick the year you want that face to come from. Yeah. You never want it to be, get a good one of me the day before. And I think if you like, if you put together a picture of like, oh, me in fourth grade, people would be like, oh, he died so young. And it's like, oh no, he lived to like 86. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need, right. So you need adulthood, but not too young that it would look sad. Yeah. I think some gravitas. I think, you know, elder statesman, but when you're still. When you still got it together. When you might have an oil painting done of yourself, wherever you are in life. Yes. My favorite painting of yourself joke is in Martin Short's book. He talks about his friendship with Steve Martin. And he says in the book, uh, the first time I went to Steve's apartment, I was so taken with the fact that a person who's uh, done as much as he has still has the time to sit for so many portraits. (laughs) Really? A really good bird. You had a portrait I did. done in Chicago that we like. We never got, did we? It exists somewhere. It exists. So here's what happened. There was a charity. Oh, no. You know what it was? It was like in a gift basket for some event I did in Chicago. The swag bag. Yeah. One of the things was to sit for a, 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 a photo. They would take a photo of you, and then they would turn the photo into a painting. And I went to do it and they said no one in all the years we've given this certificate away no one's ever shown up to do it (laughs) but it was the sort of thing it was if you could imagine the sort of painting you might have of a bank manager like that level of of, you know it's not National Portrait Gallery but it's not a child's painting it's sort of right it's right in the middle yeah and I really stressed that I wanted to do it in jeans and a t-shirt and like sit in like a woodland background yeah. Like I was thinking about nature. And then they did it, and I never got it. But then someone told, sent me a picture of it. There was an article maybe in the Chicago. We have to find the article and we'll put it in the show notes. But someone was like, I went to this place. It was in like a department store. If you remember when they used to have like places that take photos in department stores. Yeah. And they basically were like, I'm trying to get to the bottom why there's this weird painting of Seth Myers. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure also when you call me, because you did a series of photographs, and then you picked one to be turned yes, into I an did. oil painting. But I think one of the photographs is the picture that comes up when you call me. So yeah. I did do a lot of photos. And they the whole time, they were both like polite, but also knew that I was sort of snarking on the whole proceedings. Well, yeah, you were in like khakis and a t-shirt. I blew it. I should have I dressed up Maybe nice. sunglasses? Maybe I sunglasses. I definitely wore sunglasses for one of them. I... Would love to find that proof sheet. That was a dumb thing I did. We do dumb things. And now we're going to do a great thing. Oh, yeah. We have done a one listener episode. This is our second listener episode. And we have asked you to record your stories about Thanksgiving. Also, send in some questions for us. And before we go on to that episode, we'd like to do this for Christmas as well. If you've got a great Christmas story about your family on a trip or your family at Christmas. Or holiday, the holiday season. The holiday season. Good clarification, yeah. Posh. The yeah. holiday season. Speakpipe.com slash Family Trips Pod. That's where we want to hear him. You know who else I want to hear right now? Jeff Tweedy? Yes. 
And someone made a comment to me and said, you know, you make it sound like it's a drag to listen to Jeff Tweedy. Like we have to get through it oh, no. before the episode. No, I don't look. I sing this song to myself as I'm walking down the hallway. It's A plus, sure. It didn't register at all for Jeff Tweedy. Yeah, our dad also sings this song to himself a lot, which has replaced sometimes all the songs that he sings where the only word is Albert. Albert. I did say uh, Albert died. I wanted to clarify. Hopefully most of our listeners know by now. My parents have a dog named Albert. He's an old English sheepdog. My parents too. Yeah. Uh, you're at Josh's parents too. This is the sixth old English sheepdog they've had named Albert. Yeah. So Albert is very much alive and well. But he's also dead five times. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Jeff Tweedy. Chips with brother. So these will be some listener stories. The last time we did this, fantastic. Would you not agree? Excellent. Truly excellent. I think about the grandma falling out of the car all the time. I think about the bear spray, the bear spray going off in the car. You all have wonderful stories, and when you share them with us, it increases not just our joy, but the quality of this podcast. And why don't we listen to our first one right now? Growing up in Texas, my family, my parents, my two brothers and me would take a road trip to Kansas every year to visit our extended family for Thanksgiving. And one year when I was maybe around 10 or 11 years old, we drove our new minivan. This was the early 90s, if that helps paint a picture. And on Thanksgiving Day, we were asked to bring the roasted turkey, which my grandma had cooked, from her house to my aunt's house, uh, where we were all gathering on the other side of town. And on the drive, and I can't remember if it was a sharp turn or if my dad slammed on the brakes or what, but a bunch of turkey juices and broth sloshed out of the roasting pan and spilled onto the floor of the new minivan. And it had to have been like a pint or more of turkey broth because it seeped through the carpet and got into the grooves of the metal underneath where it could travel the full length of the van underneath the carpet. And my parents tried to do their best to clean it up, but it so thoroughly traveled and spread throughout the floor of the van that in the coming days and weeks, it went rancid and the minivan just reeked of spoiled turkey. And flash forward a few months, by the time we get to uh, summer back in Texas, it was just like a hot, humid turkey sauna in that van. And my parents ended up having to sell that minivan and get a new one. So that's our Thanksgiving road trip story. (laughs) <laughs> it's a, just a disaster it is a good reminder try not to travel with food that contain juices driving with with a liquid like a soup yeah is, is one of the more terrifying things i feel like i've ever done and i have done it on multiple occasions you need the proper vessel with which to carry uh, something like that. Mom will often, when she comes to visit me and Alexi, will bring like that, ch- like a giant crock pot of chili. Huh. And if she like will duct tape it close, it's a, like a crazy person. Yeah, because, yeah, she yeah. doesn't have the proper vessel. Maybe that's what she'll get for Christmas. She'll yeah, love it. <laughs> a proper uh, traveling soup vessel. Also, when mom and dad show up, when you go to the car, because I'll sometimes go to like carry their stuff in, there's so much shit in the passenger seat. Like, I feel like mom is running a small business. <laughs> like, like, what kind of stuff? Just like, you know, like pens for the crossword and their bag and three books and it, a coat and her hat. Like, you can't, you don't even, you were like, where did your legs go? Yeah. 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 I mean, turkey juice running sort of seeping in and taking over a minivan is really a thing. And I wonder who bought that minivan yeah. from them. And what kind of a deal you have to give someone. Is the first word in the classified ad, love turkey? (laughs) You know what I mean? Because maybe, let's say you're looking for a new minivan and you do love turkey and no one's ever combined the two ideas to you. Yeah. And you're like, oh, the Odyssey, this Astro. And it's like, love turkey. I love turkey. They keep reading. Yeah. I wonder if it's similar to, they say like, if someone's been murdered in a house, you need to disclose it. Yeah. I wonder what the disclosure rules are for rancid turkey infestation of a minivan. I also wonder if you are selling a minivan that reeks like turkey, 
do you, when people come over to look at it, are you always eating a hot turkey dinner so that people think that's what the smell's from? <laughs> to throw them off. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was the problem is he just, it was like summer in Texas and people be like, hey, can I stop by one to look at the turkey? And you'd always be like, you'd always have to add six hours. You'd be like, uh, seven. <laughs> they'd come over and you'd be. <laughs> or if it was a hot day, a particularly hot day, you're like, um... I'm I'm going swimming. I'm, we're going to the town pool today. Yeah. Catch me on a cooler day. And you'd just be like talking to them with your mouth open. they just like chew, like, and you're like, mm, well, I'll just go to, I'll just go to a minivan. And they'd be like, well, I guess so. And then they would yeah. be like weeks before you'd like, oh, I think the turkey's in here. Also, turkey juices is, I feel like, can both be appetizing, you know, when you're thinking about like a gravy. And it's crazy how when you change it from like a gravy to a, a, a mode of transportation, it becomes incredibly unappetizing. Well, yeah, I think as soon as you put turkey juice on a, like, carpet, let's say, yeah. that's the end of its appeal. Yeah, you never hear somebody saying the best thing about this carpet fiber is how well it holds the juices. <laughs> <laughs> I just bought some uh, dog toothpaste uh -huh. for, for Woody, and it's uh, poultry-flavored. Oh. I, have, I haven't used it yet, but... It sounds gross to me. I'm pretty sure Woody yeah. will be super excited about it. But I don't know, though, man. I think I'd be more likely to brush my teeth if it was poultry flavored. Like, <laughs> I only have mint in my toothpaste. I don't like mint the rest of the day. Yeah, but don't you like it while you're brushing your teeth? You think you'd prefer? I feel like because big teeth has, the big teeth lobby has gotten in my head that, like, mint means clean. <laughs> All right, well. Maybe you'll be the one to buck the system and bring poultry toothpaste to the uh, human masses. If anyone's out there making it, we do have ads on the podcast. <laughs> the tagline for that is, uh, don't be afraid to try it. Brock, brock. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your story. I will say, I feel like they should have known. I They should have sold it in the spring before it got hot in Texas as well. I feel like if you're in Texas and you already got a turkey van, you should have known it was going to get worse. You want to get out at the top of the market. Yeah, maybe they were just holding on, hoping it wasn't as bad as it really was. Mm -hmm. Tough stuff. All right, shall we hear our, our next story? Yes, please. Hello, Myers Brothers. I just want to say my husband and I really enjoy the podcast, and we are looking forward to it each week. I have a Thanksgiving story to share with you today. We live in New Mexico, and we were not traveling for this story, but we were hosting my brother-in-law and his family drove in from Texas and they decided to bring their defat fryer for the turkey. This was brand new to all of us. And no, this is not a story about an explosion or a fire or some kind of mishap with a fryer, but it is an important part of the story. It's Thanksgiving day. It's a beautiful sunny day in New Mexico. We live in a town just outside of Albuquerque. It's actually called a village and it's known for a lot of farm life, horses, cows, goats, peacocks, llamas, chickens, you get the idea. It's Thanksgiving, we're in the backyard, the turkey is in the defat fryer, we're all hanging out, enjoying ourselves. And around the corner from the house into the backyard walks this full-grown, beautiful turkey, like a real live turkey. <laughs> we have never seen a turkey anywhere in our neighborhood before this day or since this day. So the turkey walks around the corner and walks right up to the turkey fryer. And we're all staring at this situation in disbelief. There's a turkey frying in the fryer and there's a real live turkey outside of it <laughs> just walking around the turkey fryer. This turkey was a beautiful tom turkey. It was very tame. It actually hung out with us all afternoon. we picked it up and took pictures with it. And it just became uh, a new friend that we hung out with on Thanksgiving. Fast forward, the meal has been eaten. We've all enjoyed ourselves. We've been keeping the, we have three very large dogs that we've been keeping inside the house all afternoon because we didn't want to disturb this turkey. We kept thinking it would be leaving our yard the way it came in eventually. But now the sun is setting. It's time for the dogs to go outside and go to the bathroom. So I look outside the back steps and the turkey is perched on the railing and I decide I'm going to let the dogs out and monitor the situation. I let them out the back door. They stand directly under the turkey, completely miss it. They don't smell it. They don't see it. 
they pause for a moment and they go down the steps into the yard. And I think, okay, crisis averted. So I shut the door and about five minutes goes by and I think I better check on the dogs. So I open the back door and I call the dogs and they don't come. I don't see the turkey anymore. So I go to the front door. I call the dogs. They don't come in. I get a bad feeling about this. So my husband and I grab flashlights and we go into the yard and we see the three dogs and we see feathers Uh everywhere. And we do see the turkey, but it is busted. (laughs) It has its wing bent up to the side or behind its back. It is looking like it's in rough shape. Luckily, the dogs are not attacking it, but there has been a kerfluffle, if you will, that just occurred. So we get the dogs inside, and then we assess the state of the turkey, and we realize its eyes are blinking, and it's still breathing. So it has wisely decided to play dead. So then we're like, what do we do with this turkey? It's not our turkey. It's obviously someone's pet. It's not in good shape. So we decide to create a little home for it. We open up our shed. We have a kiddie pool. We fill it with some hay. We put the space heater in there overnight so that it's warm. We give it water and we gently pick up the turkey and place it in the kiddie pool to rest overnight. And we're like, oh, gosh, it was also I do need to add missing a toe or two. (laughs) So there was a little bit of blood involved. So we put the turkey in the little kiddie pool, we close the door, and then we're also looking at each other. What is our life? What just happened? So the next morning, we go out to check on the turkey, and it is perfectly fine. Feathers are all combed down. It is standing up, looking around. We would have never known that it had such an interaction with our dogs last night. So we decide to sort of usher it out of our property. We talked to lots of people, and nobody knew who the turkey belonged to, and we never saw it again. Thanks so much for listening. What's amazing? Wow. You know what's the most amazing thing? Here's what I think happened, Josh. Yeah. The turkeys decided every year a ton of us go missing around this time. Somebody has to go to a house with people because that's who we suspect is killing all the turkeys. (laughs) Someone has to go on Thanksgiving and find out what's going on. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So this turkey goes, gets treated like a prince, correct? Yep. Must be thinking people are the nicest creatures on earth it's clearly the 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 people are not the problem here then that turkey gets attacked by dogs the people come to the turkey's rescue that turkey went back into the uh, new mexican uh, brush it was like it, we got it all wrong it's the dogs it's the dogs <laughs> <laughs> we do not have a problem with people if anything we haven't put we should put more faith in people yeah but so many people have dogs that maybe they're afraid to come yeah. back. But they probably think, you know, these people, they keep them inside the house most of the day. They probably think people are wardens, like prison wardens for dogs. Right, but they can't control them all the time. Having a turkey walking around on Thanksgiving is a really funny, it's a really funny thing. Yeah, I was worried that when the turkey was, quote, busted, and they need, needed to do something with it, they were just going to drop it in that fryer. Yeah, the friar did was a little bit Chekhov's gun in this story. I did think the friar was going to have a payoff in the end. <laughs> oh, man. Poor turkeys. Poor turkeys. So, you know, my wife is uh, from New Mexico. She's from a little town outside of Albuquerque called Placidas. So uh, if you're listening, I wonder how far away you are from uh, Placidas. Uh, she also mentioned uh, that farming village has peacocks. Uh, I know you're vegan now, but did you ever have a turducken cock? <laughs> no. A turducken cock is, uh-huh. it's a turkey. You put a duck inside a turkey. You put a chicken inside the duck. Yeah. And then you put the whole thing inside a peacock and you deep fry it. It's not bad. Uh, yo, yeah? Not bad? Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, it's a dirty word. It's not. It's a turducken. It's tur for turkey, duck for duck, in for chicken. And then the peacock is with a cock part. And then the whole time you're eating it, if you if you have like a burp, though. Oh, what does it sound like? Yeah, that's how you can tell someone's had uh, turkey and cock for Thanksgiving. Yeah, poor turkey. I'm glad that turkey got out of there uh, and lived to tell the tale. Do you think the turkey ultimately was a little bummed when they said it's time to leave our shed? Because I feel like that turkey probably thought it had won the lottery. Like maybe that yeah. was sort of a, a financial settlement for how the dogs had treated it. Yeah. Got its own little pool, got its own little hay. It goes to a bit to that psychology of like when people halfway around the world, when there's like some tragedy and like say 200 people die in like some incident 
you don't really think much about it. But when someone's right in front of you, like when it's yes. a girl from your town. So these people were perfectly content to throw a turkey in that deep fat fryer. Yeah. But then when they met a turkey and had some connection to it, they were like, oh, we need to, we must help this. This turkey is special yeah. or different. Yeah. It would be like, you know who helped me with my flat tire? Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> Very nice. Not so bad. Not so bad. I know other yeah. people have had a different experience, but he was very helpful. Yeah. I know a broken clock is right twice a day, but he was right for my time. Uh, our buddies, uh, uh, Stradley and Kev, once had me to their place in Colorado, and they were uh, deep fat frying a turkey. And uh, those deep fat fryers are, obviously, you fill them full of grease and, and uh, well, deep fats, I guess. Yeah. And they had a beautiful back patio, uh, the stone patio. And I'm I going to, memory doesn't quite serve here, but I'm going to assume I'm the one who knocked it over accidentally. But this like hot grease just like spilled all over. This was before the turkey had even been put in all over their beautiful stone patio. And I am uh, certain stained it forever. Yeah. I recall those pictures. Yeah. That was a bad scene. That's the price of having me over at your home. <laughs> I'm a pretty clumsy yeah. fella. You should, you should keep Seth in the shed. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to keep a lookout next time I go to New Mexico, which will be around Christmas for a uh, eight fingered turkey. <laughs> they were toes. It was missing toes, but yeah. You know who, uh, who's another eight fingered turkey? Your father-in-law? My father-in-law. Yeah. This is a good time to let my listeners know that my father-in-law uh, has eight fingers. He lost two of them uh, because of a paint gun. He a, a, does a lot of building. He's in uh, construction work, and he, and he lost them years ago. And it was very sweet. I did not realize this before. My wife thought that all dads had a hand and a handle, one hand and one handle. He would call his three-fingered hand a handle, and it's very sweet. And let me just say, nobody has been slowed down less by losing a couple fingers than Tom Ash, who is... Uh, Still a beautiful uh, guitar player, incredible builder. Well, also, I just need to add in a unique twist of fate, my father-in-law to be, Eight Fingers. Wow. I don't know if I knew. How did he lose his? It's like, it's nine or eight. He's somewhere in the middle. Uh, he built his own firecracker when he was a kid. Yeah. He like built a little bomb and it went off in his hand. Oh, so he lost it when he was very young. I don't know very young. Maybe he was a teenager. Yeah. You, you hope it's not like 44 when he was making a homemade firecracker. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely not. Uh, it was uh, a, a young person's mistake, but also hasn't been slowed down. Uh, exceptional builder. Rides his motorcycle around. Yeah, no no limitations so far as I can they see. They were a different generation. They were the generation where if you lost a couple fingers, you just brushed yourself off and went back to work. Yeah, yeah. I think if I lost a couple, I'd just hang it up. I don't even think I could podcast anymore. No, that way, I mean, put you in a shed with a little kiddie pool and some hay and just live out your Live days. out my days. Uh, all right, yeah. thanks for the story. And I'm glad it had a happy-ish ending. I also feel like that turkey maybe died an hour after you sent it out your door. <laughs> <laughs> What do we got next? Hey, guys, brothers. Uh, one time when I was seven, Thanksgiving, I threw up in the green bean casserole and didn't tell anybody and live with the guilt to this day. Thanks. Take care. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. He, th he threw <laughs> up in the green bean casserole? He threw up and he didn't tell anybody. And nobody knows to this day. <laughs> now, of course, what this really is, is an indictment. It's an indictment on green bean casserole. A dish someone can puke in and no one even notices. Yeah. I mean, I will say, like, if you're reading articles about, you know, great side dishes for Thanksgiving, green bean casserole is one that they always say, don't mess with it. Like, do your grandma's green bean casserole. Yeah. It's like, you will not do better. It is such a crowd pleaser. And apparently it is such a crowd pleaser. And this is, this couldn't be a much grosser story. Yes. I see where you're going. But it is so good that you can even eat it after somebody's thrown up yeah. in it. And you're still like, this is great. This is great. It's still mostly, I'm getting mostly grandma's classic. I feel like there's some. Yeah. It, it, it must, I mean, I think for them it was, uh, it would be like if somebody was like, let's add cardamom this year. You'd be like, I don't like it as much. But I'm still going to eat yeah. it. What I really yeah. liked is how he just used his time to tell that story as quickly as possible and get out. I feel like he really used this as a means of unburdening himself of a guilt that has obviously dogged him his entire life. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, I imagine similar to the event itself, 
he just probably it happened. It was a bit surprising. And then he just got got out of there as quick as he could. I will say seven. I could 100% at seven see myself puking in a green bean casserole and then just like walking out of the room and letting the chips fall where they may. Well, yeah, you've got a seven-year-old right now. You've, you've got a good sort of line on yeah. that kind of I bet. Thinking. I bet there probably it hasn't been a week in the last year where I haven't eaten a little bit of his puke. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where you were going? <laughs> All no. right. No, this, this is very gross. This is getting very gross. It's not gross. I think we need to. It's just, it's all. Wait. Oh, my God. People are driving in their car. They're out for nice walks right That's now. That's true. And they're thoroughly disgusted. Well, you know who's, they, I'll tell you who's disgusted. Someone who's on a walk right now listening to that. And they heard that story and they were like, was that Cousin Steve? And now they're realizing. Oh, yeah. You know, 34 years ago. Maybe we need to run that voice through one of those uh voice changer so it's like back when i was yeah, seven right. i was yeah <laughs> love the podcast i threw up in, a po- in the casserole <laughs> long time listener first time storyteller uh, uh, that's how those uh voice uh changers work they send uh the script to someone who, who can talk like you were yeah that's it did. everybody's like oh is it an effect no we hey get... bill can you read this can you read this yeah, in yeah. your scary voice i puked in the green bean casserole <laughs> thanks bill uh, we'll we'll get back to you. I, mean, I think it was good. I could do a little yeah. scarier. No, I think that's good. We got it. Um, yeah, but don't go far. I hope that brought him peace, sharing that with us. Yeah. Yeah, I really do. Yeah, because it didn't bring anybody else peace. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I guess. Hey, we're going to take a quick break and hear from some of our sponsors. This episode of Family Trips is brought to you by Nissan. Posh, these days too many people have to settle for the next best thing, especially when it comes to choosing a car. Yeah, but at Nissan, there's a vehicle type for everyone, for every driver who wants more. Whether you want more adventure, more electric, more action, more guts, or more turbocharged excitement, Nissan is here to make sure you get it. Because Nissan is all about giving people a whole spectrum of thrills to choose from with a diverse lineup of vehicles. Sports cars to sedans to EVs, pickups, crossovers with Nissan's diverse lineup. Anyone can find something to help them reach their more. What are you looking for more of, Josh? I like a nice ride. I like a nice sound system. I like something that's, yeah, that's comfortable. You like to have room to load up a bunch of gear, go somewhere, do an adventure. I do. I'm never happier than when I have sort of a, a full car, a roof rack on my car. Makes me happy. And all I need is a cup holder for an iced coffee. And Nissan can provide you with both of those things. So thanks again to Nissan for sponsoring this episode of Family Trips and for the reminder to find your more. Learn more at NissanUSA.com. Hey, everybody. We're very excited. Josh and I are going to be going to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with our parents. We're going to stay at an Airbnb this time. And I can't wait, Josh. Just to be under the same roof with mom and dad is very exciting. Yeah. And in a roof that's not, you know, our childhood roof, it's going to be fun to be in a house. And yeah, it is a good roof. Um, And one of the things we do when we get together is we play Scrabble. There is going to be a Scrabble tournament. And that is one of the comforts of an Airbnb is, you know, you're going to have the room, the space to do the things you would do at home with the excitement of knowing when you walk outside, you're in a different city. And also, it's just nice to wake up and come down to the kitchen and make coffee. And as people wake up, they join you and you feel like you're at home. Yeah. If they don't understand the coffee machine, there's going to be trouble. But I'll handle the coffee. I'm up earlier than them. It's amazing how late mom and dad sleep these days. Yeah, that's true. They do (laughs) sleep very late. Um, So thanks to Airbnb. We're looking forward to doing that very special episode. Here we go. Let's hear the next one. This was a fall RV trip through Kansas. We were on our way to Colorado to meet my parents at a cabin. And I had four young kids and a kitten. So we were driving through Kansas and the kids were in the back of an RV And suddenly the RV starts to pull to the side and I heard an extra noise. One of our back tires had blown out. Uh, When I got over to the side of the road, I saw in the distance a small tornado drop from the sky and it came from a cloud structure. It wasn't a dust devil. It was clear it was a tornado, just fortunately small at that point. Um, Fall is prime tornado season and the family RV trip was before cell phones and weather apps. But we were not in a good spot for a tornado. We just passed by a hotel maybe 300 yards behind us. 
And so I yelled at the kids to get out of the RV and they were very confused. Mom, do we grab our luggage? I was like, no, just run. So I grabbed the kitten and we made it to the hotel. We were breathless. I'm sure we overwhelmed the poor teenage desk clerk, but I needed to get the kids, the kitten, me, and potentially the teenage desk clerk into an interior room. It was a small town and it wasn't busy. And it was better than being in the RV. So fortunately, things calmed down. The storm passed and a guy came to change the tire. And the guy had to get up under the RV. And as he slid on the pavement to access the tire, his pants had come down and I could see a significant portion of his butt crack. So I got my camera from the RV and I took a picture. And so that's the family memory we have of this trip. It's a a slightly tilted RV, a butt crack, and absolutely nothing else. I mean, that's amazing. For it to go from there's a tornado to actually the big takeaway was was the butt crack. Yeah. (laughs) I bet, I bet based on, on the age of those kids, like blow down tire, tornado, butt crack, I'm pretty sure every one of them would sequence it in the order she did. Right. Also, I feel like kids who have just encountered a tornado, I think anyone who just encountered a tornado would be pretty afraid. Yeah. But to be able to redirect children's fear to their joy of a butt crack, yeah, I think probably settles some nerves in a way that you might not be able to settle otherwise. Yeah, when the kids are anxious about anything, we have like an album of butt crack photos. (laughs) You know, first day of school, we just kind of thumb through that thing and just settle some right yeah. down. I will say there was a moment yeah. where she said, I saw a tornado. I rushed the kids out of the RV, and I really wanted her to say, drove off to safety and haven't seen the kids to this day. <laughs> I thought the RV was going to get spun up and uh, taken away, twister style. I mean, I, you think there's nothing worse than a flat tire in an RV, but then you go out to look at it and there's a, a tornado drops from the sky. Also, a tornado dropping from the sky. May I never live to see one. Yeah. You wouldn't consider yourself a storm chaser. No. A storm runner from. Yeah. I think everybody yeah. agrees that I'm a real good storm <laughs> runner from. Love a love a thunderstorm. Love a rainstorm. Yeah. Don't love to be in a, anything, anything that's got an eye. You know how I feel about that. Anything? Anything with one eye. Tornadoes, cyclopses, pirates. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Those are the three things that scare me the most. One-eyed things. Things. Yeah. I love a one-eyed dog, I got to say. You do, right? Yeah. And, we, you know, I've seen some one-eyed cats. They're cool, right. too. I'm sure there's some one-eyed people out there that are great, too. Not cyclopses. Those aren't people. I wonder if there's, because it's a cyclop eye, you know, if it's a weird plural. Yeah. Not sure. Don't use it very often. Yeah. Well, you almost never see two. <laughs> like, historically, it's never like, oh, they, it's like he's got a brother. <laughs> <laughs> historically? Yeah. I feel like every, all the Cyclops stories you read, there's just the one Cyclops. Then maybe they're just mad because they're lonely. Yeah, that's true. And here we are putting it on the big, the big one eye. Yeah. Because I think the thing is, like, look, I think you can eye patch your way into coolness, but the Cyclops problem is it's just the one big eye in the middle of the head. Mm, Yeah. You can't act like, oh, yeah, something happened. (laughs) (laughs) Right. They're just like, no. Yeah. You're a mythological beast. Yeah. I completely forget, based on what we're talking about, what the story was. Well, I was just going to come back to, if you were that young employee of that hotel, and some woman runs in with four children and is like, quick, we need to get to an interior room and you're coming with us. If there's a moment of pause where you're like, I'm not going in a room with you. Right. I don't know you. Also, I work here. I work here at the front desk. I don't know. I feel like it'd be a pretty awesome scam if you would like run in with four kids and be like, we got to go to an interior room. And then your, then your crew, your Ocean's Eleven crew would come in and just... Rob the hotel. Or if you get into that room and you're like, we have to wait for this storm to pass. And you really just like want your kids to be able to sleep in some beds and not in the RV. And after the kids have had a nice rest, you're like, all right, the storm's probably passed. Can I also just say there's one hero in this story, which is the guy who was uh, changing the tire on the RV. And he's the one who got his his butt cracked, (laughs) clicked. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's what happens. Those are the cracks. 
as Josh always says, them's the cracks. Them's, right, them's the cracks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right, let's hear our next story. All right, this is our last story. Hi, Myers Brothers. I enjoy your show and wish to share my fall vacation story, but it's specifically for your mother. I got a job teaching American dependent kids in Germany in 1974. I had planned for many years to go to Europe, and this was my big opportunity. Every weekend, my new friends and I would travel to all the famous cities and must-see places. It was fantastic. During the fall of my second year stationed at an air base called Sembach, my parents decided they too should see Europe, neither had been, so we made plans to meet up in Paris around Thanksgiving. Everything was going well, and to celebrate, when they got there, we booked a dinner at a white tablecloth Parisian restaurant. By this time, I was very confidently smug with my one semester of French 101 skills in college. I could ask, where is the White Horse Hotel? And I would like an orangina, please. We all got appropriately dressed for this nice French restaurant. Uh, We're seated and given those uh, incredibly large menus. Of course, it was all in French. And let's just say I was pretty confident in my language skills, owing to the 13 months I had already lived in an entirely different country. (laughs) My parents ordered fish. And after some mental translating gymnastics, I ordered tête à veau, our waiter, who was the quintessentially stereotypical French waiter, who even had a white napkin over his arm, repeated my order. Tête à veau, mademoiselle? Oui, tête à veau. After the correct amount of waiting for such a fancy meal, out came our orders on those giant white plates. First, my parents had their trout dishes served, and then out came mine. What? I mentally translated as head of veal, was supposed to be a nice cut of veal, a shoulder cut perhaps. It was actually veal brains. More accurately, it was just one complete brain swimming in a white sauce, white on white on white. I didn't let on that I felt like an idiot. Not to give my French waiter the satisfaction of being right, as he and I both knew he was. When my parents were involved with their own delicious dishes, I carefully cut off a slice, made like I was eating it, and dropped it in my purse. I repeated this quite a few times and was able to do so because I never have been a fancy kind of girl. Yep, I made a hearty dent in the veal brains, but was justifiably humbled and hungry. I've told this story to 40 years of students since then, and my motto has always been, or the moral is hubris kills. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And I'm a vegetarian now. <laughs> <laughs> That's also where the uh, expression you got veal for brains comes from. <laughs> Can I have a moment here to get back? It's a French expression. It's a French expression. Yeah. You got veal for brains is when you are, yeah. when you're so, uh, <laughs> when you're not smart enough to know the language you're ordering food in. Hey, can I just say something about the French real quick, Josh? And I think you know how I feel about them. Eh, there's not a cuisine in the world where you can accidentally order veal brains. If you're in an Italian restaurant and you say in Italian, I want veal brains, they say, we don't have veal brains. If you're in America and you speak a foreign language and you go to one of our fine dining establishments, you ask for veal brains, you're not going to get veal brains. They don't have veal brains in the back, but they do in France. This is France's fault. Yeah. It is France's fault. Yeah, you don't don't put it on a menu. Yeah. I got a real problem with uppity menus. Yeah. There was a time in my life I didn't know what a branzino was. Mm-hmm. And I was uh I was eating everything at this time in my life. And I asked the waiter, I was like, What's uh what's a branzino? And uh she said, It's a Lou de Mer. Yeah. And I said, What? And then she was like, It's a white fish. I was like, Yes, yeah, say white yeah. fish. I think there's a very small Venn diagram of people who don't know what Branzino is, but do know what Lou de Mer is. You know yeah. what I mean? If you're out on Branzino, maybe go start start at the uh, building blocks of that one. Right. But yeah, that's that's very inappropriate. I remember famously our our grandfather, Frank, there was a story of him ordering steak tartare and our grandmother, Addie, sort of rolled her eyes knowing that he wasn't going to like it. But he he was sure it was just like a steak with tartare sauce on it. Probably. He sort of came from uh, fish people. <laughs> um, 
And then, yeah, he got that raw, that raw meat and was, uh, was appalled. And, uh, our grandmother Addie just sort of rolled her eyes at his. She was an eye roller. She was an eye roller. Her daughter certainly inherited it. She was very fancy. Very fancy. And Frank was less so. Less, less fancy. I wonder if she had to try to move that purse the way our first storyteller had to sell that minivan. You know, once you get veal brains in a purse, <laughs> very yeah. hard to get the smell out on a hot Parisian summer. Yeah, a similar move also that mom has done, and I think she's talked about maybe on your show, but she used to, if there were Brussels sprouts when she was a little girl, she would go up to her room and put on her cowboy boots and she would put the Brussels sprouts in her cowboy boots because she couldn't leave the table until she had like eaten some of them or maybe finished her plate. Yeah. But Brussels sprouts in a boot, yeah, I imagine would leave, would leave some uh, evidence, some olfactory evidence. It's also funny that during her sort of New England upbringing that nobody was on to the fact that if she came downstairs with boots... <laughs> She had a plan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure she looked adorable in those cow cowboy boots. Even to this day, if I hear spurs, I know what we're having for dinner. <laughs> if I hear the jingle jangle of spurs, I know what mom's cooking. Yeah. I came fully around on Brussels sprouts. So, yeah, oh, yeah. I think Brussels sprouts might be the food that was, when we were kids, in sort of child cartoon pop culture, Brussels sprouts were sort of the worst thing on earth. The biggest leap from the way it was presented to me in, in sort of kids' uh, culture. Yeah. I wonder if, like, if castor oil is actually pretty good. Yeah. That would be interesting. I mean, I can't imagine it but is. But isn't castor oil, was, I think it was, like, for the purposes, though, of, like, wasn't castor oil to make you throw up? I don't Oh, maybe. I think you had it right before um, the green bean casserole came out. You would have it. <laughs> it's like having I have a, hey, yeah. should we do a quick shot of castor oil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you'd be puking them. Oh, right. I mean, definitely uh, as we go into, I mean, maybe an apology to our viewers. Hopefully they've enjoyed this as much as we have. But certainly not the most appetizing Thanksgiving stories. We've had uh, uh, yeah, veal no. greens. Uh, somebody uked in the casserole. We had uh, turkey juices in a minivan and butt crack. So, yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, if there's anyone to blame, it's, it's our listeners. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so it's right. It's coming back. Hey, we're going to take a quick break and hear from some of our sponsors. Family Trips is supported by Marine Layer. Man, I got to say, I love Marine Layer. Their shirts are so soft. They got things that are staples that don't feel like staples. They're elevated. And I've said this before. No one has a better sense of soft than my brother Josh. And I got one of these shirts on his endorsement. It is incredible, you guys. And also incredible, to spread holiday cheer, our listeners get a 15% off discount with our exclusive link. Just head to marinelayer.com slash trips. Talk about your favorite Marine Layer, Josh. They've got this new winter collection. And if you're buying some gifts this holiday season, you don't have to look any further. They've got this great sort of super vintage ski-inspired look with a ton of bright colors, color block puffer vests, and a lot more. The best part? Free shipping and returns for an entire year, no questions asked. So I, you, Josh, we don't have to worry about getting someone the wrong size color or anything like that. I think we can all admit that great gifts can be hard to find. Look no further than Marine Layer. For a limited time, get 15% off at marinelayer.com slash trips. That's marinelayer.com slash trips for 15% off your entire order. Saving your closet one shirt at a time. This episode of Family Trips is brought to you by the McDonald's app. You guys, everybody's life is moving a million miles per hour. That just happens every week, but uh, during the holiday season, it gets even a little bit faster. So if you're running late, or you only have a 20 minute break for lunch, or you're starving and you're desperately craving, I don't know, a quarter pound of cheese and a large Diet Coke, maybe it's the morning, and you want your sausage drink muffin with egg and a premium roast coffee before you get to the office. But guess what? Sometimes you go into the McDonald's and the line is too long. Well, with the McDonald's app, you just order in the app, pick your favorite location, select curbside or counter, then you head on over. Boom. Your food is ready. And this is the part that is more important to me than anything else. If I'm on the road with my kids and I just want to make sure that when we pull off, the food is ready, that is when I want the McDonald's app to skip that line. It is very nice for me. It's very nice for the kids. Order ahead in the app to save time. Prep while you're on the way excludes drive through Participating McDonald's. Copyright 2023 McDonald's. 
Thank you so much for your stories, everyone. And now, something new. I'm very excited about this, Josh. It is time for a trivia game. But to explain the rules, I'm going to turn it over to our producer, Sam. First of all, hello, Sam. Hello. It's so nice to see you guys. This is Sam, everybody. (laughs) Actually, now you're seeing me because I'm always seeing you guys on Zoom. Yes, this is very exciting for us. Uh, Sam is a fantastic producer, and I believe this is the first time anyone is hearing her voice. Yes, yeah. Thank you, guys. Is this what guests feel like to come on? This is so exciting. (laughs) If if it's gratitude, if you're feeling gratitude, yes. (laughs) (laughs) That is what I'm feeling, yes. Okay, so we have a trivia game that... You know, there's not a name for this game, so maybe we can come up with that along the way. But it's brought to you by my accomplices, Larry and Hillary. They have provided Mm -hmm. me with some trivia about you guys, about your life. So here's how it works. I'm going to ask you guys a question, and these are all fall, Halloween, Thanksgiving-related questions. And you guys have to answer at the same time to see if you have the same response, if you remember things the same way. Great. So don't answer super fast. Try and like yeah. try, take a try minute to, do to like, think. And then like a one, two, three. Yes. Answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll cue you guys to answer. You can, have a, you can have a few seconds to think. Okay, great. Thank you, Sam. Okay, so first question. When you guys were around six and eight years old, you went to a restaurant in Bedford that had a Halloween costume contest. What did Josh dress up as? All right, you guys think uh, you know? I'm ready. Should right. we so one, two, it'll three? It'll be one, two, three, answer. Yes. Yes. Sam, you count. Okay. One, two, three. Pirate. Clown. (laughs) Now, Josh, what did you say? Clown. I said clown. Mm. The answer was the Incredible Hulk. They are definitely wrong. (laughs) The bonus question is what did Seth dress up as? I'm ready. Okay. You ready, Josh? Yeah, sure. All right. One, two, three. Nothing, Nothing or private eye. Yeah, private <laughs> wow, eye. Wow, that was really good. The answer, and I quote, was he put on a raincoat and called himself a detective, but had no real interest in being there. Okay, so I think right. <laughs> well, the story behind this is also there was a there was a fifty dollar contest uh, for the best costume. Yeah, and we went to this restaurant, and I was in costume, and Seth didn't want to wear his costume, so he left it in the car. And then when he saw there was no one else dressed up in the restaurant, he went kid. out to the car and got his trench coat and his hat, and then they made us split the $50 oh. gift certificate. Now, we should know. My plan was, look, I'm just going to walk to second place here. You know, there was supposed to be a prize for second place, too. And I was not trying to take cash out of Josh's pocket. But then they they it was they pulled some bullshit on us, and they said, oh, my God, we can't decide between. I will say, Josh, it was not Incredible Hulk, right? I think it was a clown. I think it was a clown, oh, too. Oh, all right. Yeah, because I, I know I had, like, I had a lot of face makeup on. I had gone for it. Yeah. And I'm not entirely sure. The one way mom and dad could prove this is by showing us a picture, but maybe they didn't take pictures that night. Did you love Halloween, Josh? I liked Halloween. I'm sort of over it now, but I did like it. I remember one year I was very <laughs> I was very happy I was an oven and I had like just a cardboard box that I painted to look like an oven and we had some burners, some like those old coils that would be on burners and I sort of jammed those into the top of it and I thought that was a great costume. At okay. the end of the day, my memory, uh, no matter what you were dressed as, is this. We both got $25, and the only difference is you looked like a dork the whole dinner. <laughs> and I was just a kid. I was just a kid. I was, six. I was just a kid in a trench coat, living my best life. I also do think we were, uh, I think we were older than six and eight as well. And I think, because at eight, I feel like you would have worn a costume. I feel like you were a bit more jaded. Yeah. Maybe that 12 year old. Like, I'm over this. Or f- even 14. One of the takeaways from this trivia game should be that my parents get points <laughs> deducted from whatever <laughs> whatever tally they have. All right. You ready for number two? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What was the name of the mountain you guys would go away to for a few days to a week in the fall when you were in eighth grade? Let me know when you have an answer. Uh, I got it. How come I can't remember? This is, I think it's too traumatic for me. Um. <laughs> Hold on. I can't. How do I? Oh, man, this is bad. All right. Yeah, it really is. All right. You want to count us down, Sam? Yep. Or are you ready, Seth? Yeah. He got it. He had his thinking face on. I I think I've got it. 
All right. One, two, three. Cardigan. Cardigan. (laughs) (laughs) Seth, you cheater. I think I had a lag. I think there was a lag on the Zoom. Mm. Uh, cardigan, we both got it about the yeah, same time. Yeah, it is, it is cardigan. You know, this yes. is where it's tricky because we sound so much alike. I felt like maybe I was first and Josh was a few <laughs> seconds after. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely yeah, forgot. Cardigan. Full points so, for, for cardigan. I have one here, bonus commentary from Larry. You guys could probably tell the story, but what I have is... Oh, my God. Our, my entire life is bonus commentary <laughs> from Larry. <laughs> Is that, do, do you do you have a story for this? Do you remember? He said one time Seth slipped and hit his head on a rock on the mountain and had to be carry off. It wasn't my which head. He was actually very happy about since he didn't have the best time up there. Josh, oh however, God. had great experiences. This, by the way, like the fact that he thinks I hit my head and Josh is the Incredible Hulk. I'm worried the next question is going to be like, "What's your younger sister's name?" <laughs> I believe you hit your back. Seth, I hit correct? my back. Thank you, Josh, for remembering my. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We would take like a. It was a camping trip where you stayed overnight with your class. I think it was a two day trip. It was the whole the whole first quarter of school. The whole first three months of school or two months maybe was devoted to the outdoors. And so, in science classes, you were studying how many board feet are in a tree. In English class, you were doing a lot of Robert Frost and Thoreau and sort of outdoor authors and, you know, history, you do the, you know, history of New Hampshire and geology stuff. And it would culminate with a long weekend where you would go with your homeroom, you would sort of have a campsite and all the homerooms for the eighth graders would be sort of dotted around this mountain. And there were, you know, your teachers were with you. Some parents would be there. And Seth on one of the hikes slipped and wet leaves. You were there, so. <laughs> uh, If you read almost any Yelp review about outside, it'll say uh, too many wet leaves. I slipped and I hit my lower back on a rock. Now, I don't know if I was being dramatic about it and if it was a situation <laughs> where I could have walked it off, but I definitely fell hard and I hit my back. And because it was a school trip and because of the sort of legal exposure, they sent up like a rescue team to carry me down the hill on a stretcher, just sort of like uh, handing me down. And then my parents came and picked me up and I went home. And it it was not the worst thing that I got off that mountain. But I remember being, this is, this reflects very poorly on me because I thought this was maybe the coolest thing that ever happened to me. And on Monday, they're probably going to give like a long announcement (laughs) <laughs> the morning announcements about uh, the heroic, my the, my heroic rescue and the, how I'm doing. And at this point, by the way, fine. It should know I'm pretty quickly <laughs> walking around. And they didn't even mention it. And I remember saying, I, can you believe the nerve? They didn't mention it. And uh, my dad, who's very practical and a straight shooter, he's like, they're not going to tell a bunch of kids somebody fell on their back. <laughs> on a school trip. And I'm like, oh, that makes more, that makes more sense. And I feel like your whole sort of your all your grades for those months were based on your cardigan journal yeah. that you had to maintain that had all your sort of classes. It was like one of those. That's so fun that your school even did that, though. I wish mine did. Yeah, yeah it was great. But Seth lost his journal. Oh, I mean, I mean yeah. Just like made it up or. It was bad. This is where it's time for me to. I really want to get out. I was a terrible, terrible student. And not only because I would just never do the work. I was so lazy. I was so, it's shameful. I probably, you know, I would be the kind of kid who's like, yeah, I mean, I hit my back. My journal went flying. (laughs) Like just like some (laughs) sort of, like I would use anything as an excuse. But I do remember because you were supposed to, you know, um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, what's the, just like leaves where you put a piece of paper over a leaf. What's the word I'm looking for? Not tracing, but like do like, uh, you know, pencil over them. Yeah. What is that called? Yeah. Yeah. A gentle, a gentle trace. A gentle, rubbing. Yeah. And I I remember like going out in our backyard and doing it, but just picking leaves off our trees there because I hadn't done any in Camp Coniston. And again, dad, I was like, I fell on my back. He's like, you're telling me nobody did any work the first day and a half. (laughs) You were supposed to do all the work. And I was like, oh. so yeah, I do. I do remember. I did F work, but because I fell on a school trip, they gave, probably gave me like a B minus. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. That sounds fair. 
well, very different experiences on Cardigan. Yeah, mine was great. Maybe that's maybe that was the moment. Maybe that <laughs> slip and fall was the moment I uh, I turned my back on nature. <laughs> All right, next trivia question. Um, okay, this one actually is not really a one word answer. So you guys might have to answer at different times. What were goober runs on Thanksgiving night? Okay, oh. I can do this. Do you got right. it, Posh? Yeah, so I, I think wait, yeah. I think we can. Will you? Will you acknowledge we're both going to get this right? Yes. Okay. Can we maybe just say the key player in a Goober run? Let's say that person's name. Who was driving mm. the Goober run? All right. All right. One, two, three. Uncle, Uncle Kurt. Kurt. You are correct. <laughs> yeah. And actually, what I have, again, from Larry, Uncle Kurt taking them to stores for candy or later smoking weed, I think. No, I never smoked weed with Uncle Kurt. Mm. Um, I will say Uncle Kurt was the first person who, as I became older, I realized was smoking weed all the time. (laughs) In that era, probably. Yeah, no matter how freezing cold it was, he would go outside for a walk. And for a walk, and he didn't smoke cigarettes. Yeah, Kurt had a lot of jobs. And at some point, I feel like he was training to be, he had taken like some defensive driving classes, like he was going to be a bodyguard or something. Yeah. So goober runs would be like to go get goobers and candy and treats at like a at like a store 24 open all hours. Very convenient store. Yeah. But then he sort of he learned some like crazy defensive driving stuff and we would there would be some aggression to those drives, which was always fun. And we would maybe go to like swing by the blockbuster video and rent rent movies. I do remember you know our parents belong to the Manchester Country Club now, but when we were kids it was cheaper to have a junior member so i was made the member at the club and mom and dad could play there maybe six or eight times a year but they had to play with me and that was plenty of golf for them back in the day and kurt and his buddy whose name i couldn't tell you it was zucchini or button but his real name was chris okay yeah we call him zini zini button they love to play golf so they would get to play with me and if i ever hit a straight drive they would intentionally pound their drives into the woods and then go smoke weed because I was just a kid. And uh, they were like, it's anytime I hit a straight drive, they would they would twist themselves and be like, all right, we got to go look for these balls in the woods. And <laughs> Do you remember why in the end he uh, wasn't a bodyguard? No. Failed his drug test. <laughs> <laughs> I just did a show in my hometown, in our hometown, And uh, we were at the aforementioned Manchester Country Club afterwards because Uncle Kurt was there. A bunch of my high school friends were there, including Greg Henderson, one of our oldest best friends, who's uh, truly the greatest. And Kurt was wearing a crazy, crazy ill-fitting jacket, so tight. And Greg said he walked over to him and he said, I don't know if you remember me, Uncle Kurt. I'm, I'm Seth's old friend Greg. He goes, yeah, I remember you. Look at us. Neither of our shirts fit. Greg was like, I don't know. <laughs> Mine's in the same neighborhood as yours. <laughs> we did have like the classic VHS movie uncle. Like he was the kind of uncle of a John Hughes film. He was everything you wanted. Uncle Kurt was a little bit dangerous, but mostly uh, warm <laughs> and sweet. And the kind of guy who would drive you to get Cool Ranch Doritos at 11 at night yeah. on Thanksgiving Day. Also, such a VHS uncle that I that I think he even had a Betamax. He did have a Betamax. Yeah. He did have a Betamax. I love that. Yeah. Remember we watched Beanie and Cecil? Yeah. Bob Clampett cartoons. Let's sing the song real like, quick, Josh. It's time for it's Beanie time and for Cecil. Beanie and... We, you can't sing on Zoom No, I together. think that was good. It's time for Beanie and Cecil in a Bob, Bob, Bob Clampett, Clampett cartoon. cartoon. That was beautiful. Either edit that out or everything else. You think maybe it's the podcast without that or it's just that? Probably just that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have two more questions. Great. I'm going to actually, I'm going to reverse the questions because you guys kind of, you kind of just answered one in a way, but. You might have said too much. You might have said too much. All right. Whose cartoon was Beanie and Cecil? (laughs) How'd you know? Yeah. Uh, Okay. These answers leave me with more questions, so maybe you guys can explain. Who okay. did Sage, a cousin, announce that she was going to marry at Thanksgiving dinner? Oh, yeah, I know that. You do? Yeah. Um, 
Josh, just give me a hint. You will you'll get the full points. Is it real or is it a joke? It was a real announcement. Okay. It didn't happen. Okay. All right. Ready. I think you might get it then. And I'll answer. I have an answer, but. Okay. All right. One, two, three. Zini button. I was going to say Steve Rails back brother. <laughs> was it Zini button? <laughs> you know, maybe yeah. what I have is zucchini. Yeah, that's Zini. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Zucchini. Zini being short for zucchini. And then bonus question. What was zucchini's nickname? Button. Yeah. Zini button. Yeah. yeah. I have the, yeah. I have the button. So yeah. I feel like I feel yeah. like we need some explanation here. I, I, here's the thing. I asked Kurt so many times, why do you call him Zini Button? He could never answer. Again, remember, these are guys who just would like shank a drive to go smoke weed in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> who were working at our like grandfather's uh, liquor store. Yeah. Like Kurt was running the liquor store at that point. Okay. And Zini worked there. And so did Sage. All I know is that this is true of any family. When someone announces at Thanksgiving... They're going to marry Zucchini Button. The only reaction is pride. <laughs> uh, Zini Button was also a, a sort of um, an amateur inventor. Do you remember his invention, Josh? I don't. He had an invention called the Leg Up, which was a sort of small foldable ottoman that you would bring with you over to people's homes. Because sometimes you'd be sitting at a person's home and you'd want to put your leg up. <laughs> And so they would explain it to you. And it was so, even as a kid, I remember thinking, wait, this is terrible. And they would explain, yeah, you know, you know how Ottomans have four legs? And you'd say, yeah, this only has three and you can fold it up. And so you just bring it into a house. I think a lot of their ideas were like, well, it sounded good in the woods. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there was a time also when Zini came over and, Dad wasn't expecting anyone to come over, and he like had just dad had just gotten out of the shower, and he heard someone coming in through the front door, and dad like ran to the banister, and Zini was on the steps, and dad was completely naked, yeah. And Zini looked up, and maybe that's where he got the idea for the the three legged ottoman. That's true. <laughs> I will say uh, the best angle to see dad naked is from directly below. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys ready for your last trivia question? Yes. Who cooked the Thanksgiving turkey when your family had Thanksgiving dinner at Seth's apartment on Armitage in Chicago? All right, I've got a guess. Okay. But I'm worried about it. Josh, you got a guess? Um, so Armitage, uh, which is my first apartment out of college in Chicago, and we had one of our great Thanksgiving dinners there. Yeah, I got a guess, but I'm not confident. Okay. All right. One, two, three. Denny. Denny? Oh. So you guys will have to tell me because all I have is the fraternity house cook. Oh, oh my goodness. Jeff Baker? James Baker cooked it. Look at that. No memory of it, except now it's coming flooding back. Yeah, so I lived with three fraternity brothers and we we're a year out of college. And one of them, not me, someone smarter than me, thought, oh, I bet James Baker would cook a turkey for us and bring it. James Baker was such a fantastic Chicago character. He had, and again, this is the 90s, late 90s. He had a Mike Ditka mustache, and he wore those sort of Zubaz MC Hammer pants. Yep. (laughs) And he cursed like a sailor. And yet he was uh, an incredibly warm human being and was a very big part of our life. And I guess we paid him to come and make that turkey. And it was, God love him. It was a great meal. Yeah. I mean, I think when you go from cooking for like 60 dudes a day or whatever it was, 50 dudes a day, to just having to do a turkey for a Thanksgiving, I'm sure he was all over that. Yeah. All right. Good job. Mom and dad actually came up with a, a trivia question we got wrong. Yeah, yeah. They were awesome. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Larry and Hillary. And thank you, Sam. Yeah. Great job, Sam. Thank you, guys. I'm very worried that, uh, I mean, I hope it's not hard for people to have uh, a voice that is not identical to Josh and ours. <laughs> Fresh breath of air. <laughs> and now this is very exciting. It's time for some listener questions. Yahoo. Woo. Hi, Seth and Josh. Uh, my name is Aaron, and I wanted to ask that you guys dress up a lot for Halloween as kids. 
And if so, um, did you guys have a favorite costume? Like, is there one that stood out that reminds you all of a good memory? Um, love the podcast. I'm really enjoying it. And um, such a huge fan. And much love to you all. Thanks so much. Much love to you. That was so sweet. Thank you. You explained your stove. I will say, I remember once, and this is a real credit to Dad's story, I said I wanted to be a pile of garbage. And Dad uh, cut out a bunch of like strips of paper and tape them all to a, sort of a sweatsuit, I think. And I, I felt like a rustling pile of garbage. And it was a really good custom. I remember when we were living in Amsterdam, working for Boom Chicago, we had a haunted house at the theater. And I wanted to come up with something creepy. And I went to some sort of Halloween store. And I got one of those white masks that's just like very blank. It's just sort of a smooth, creepy mask. And I put on white underpants and I got white like body paint and I painted my whole body white and I had this mask and I made my face white and I put the mask sort of on top of my head. I feel like I was giving some of those like Pan's Labyrinth vibes. Yes. I, I was pretty, pretty happy with that. I've got a picture of that somewhere. I remember one Amsterdam Halloween, I decided I was going to be Aquaman. And I bought orange tights, um, sort of like a green underpants and an orange top. And what I had to do then was draw those scales. And I got a Sharpie to draw scales on my shirt. And everybody busted on me because, like, I started at the top by the neckline. And there were these really tight, good-looking scales. And by the end, they were just big old loopy because I realized I'd given <laughs> myself way too much work. I was a real shaky Aquaman. Yeah. But back in the day where I was okay going to a Halloween costume in tights, so... Some, something was going good. <laughs> Let's hear the next one. Hey, Myers Brothers. It's Brooke. I'm a big fan of the pod. And my question for the whole Myers family is, how do you guys stay so close and have so much fun together? I feel like it's so beautiful and also kind of rare for a family to be so close and enjoy spending so much time together. And... The kind of family dynamic that I see you guys have is what I would want for my future family. And I'm wondering if you have any tips. Thanks. It's such a good question. And I feel like the credit goes to mom and dad, but I weirdly, yeah. even having lived through it, I constantly am wondering, what is the playbook? How do you do this? Yeah. I mean, I think I try with kind of everything. Like, no matter where you are, no matter what situation you're in, you should try to enjoy it. And it's sort of like... When I used to get pissy as a kid, because I would, I'd get mad at things, I'd feel some slight, and I'd get angry, and I'd run up to my room and sort of give myself a self-imposed time out. But then everyone downstairs was still having fun. I'd be alone, and then I would hear everyone enjoying each other downstairs, and as soon as I was ready to go enjoy other people again. All I had to do was go downstairs. They always treated us like friends. I think that was the part. Yeah. I don't think I'm faking it when I say they're two of my best friends. Yeah. And then they also, I was always great to introduce them to your friends. Yeah. You know, the, the amount of people in our lives that my friends we made that will, independent of us, hang out with our parents is, a, I think, is a really special uh, credit to them as well. But it's great. I mean, yeah. I love Thanksgiving so much because uh, we get to see him. I love the tradition of them being on the show. I love that we go to Pittsburgh every year and, and see a football game together. An ex-girlfriend of mine, I remember I went to a Yankees-Red Sox game with her and my parents. And she told this story to some other people. She did not tell me. She said, I went uh -huh. to put my arm around uh, Seth during the game, and I realized his dad's arm was already around him. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like it is the best, truest example of what is it like to date someone who comes from our family, <laughs> which is like, get in line. Yeah. Yeah. They, they weren't without authority as well. Like, yes, they treated us like friends, but we, we also had, you know, there were rules and discipline, but that came from a place of just wanting us to be safe and good people. Yeah. It's so important to me that our parents think we're good people. They have been that to so many. Yeah. And also like... Dad was never shy to call out when someone was being an asshole. Yeah. And so that taught us from a young age, like, oh, that kind of behavior 
is the behavior of an asshole. So I don't want to do that. I remember as a kid, the way you could tell was he would point at a person and out loud in public say, hey, you're being an asshole. <laughs> and that was how we knew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was how you knew. He really, uh, what's the expression? Hung a lantern on he it? He put a lantern on it. <laughs> yeah. He hung a lantern on it. Remember, you would always say, you got veal for brains. <laughs> Uh, all right, next question. Hi, Myers Brothers. Greetings from the city of Eternal Spring. I'm in Medellin, Colombia. I've been enjoying the podcast a lot, and it seems that you and your families are all very well-traveled. Uh, in my personal experience, I've found that sometimes the language barrier gets in the way of an adventure when you're traveling abroad, and I wanted to know how do you tackle that if you've ever encountered it? Do you go back to your mime training days, Josh? Or Seth, does Impression Camp have a class on pretending to speak a foreign language? <laughs> Wonderful question. Thank you so much. We did rely on Josh's mime training a great many trips. Do you remember that time we were in Germany and we, we got trapped in that glass box? <laughs> I got us out. <laughs> I got us out. I found the small latch. Yeah. I should note, uh, because you're from Medellin, our dad weirdly travels so much more. Our dad has seen so much more of the world than we have because he traveled so much for work. He did a ton of work in Colombia. Yeah. I guess, what would you say? Cartel lawyer? Is that? <laughs> uh, he does He does trade finance and he was. He just spent a lot of time in across the whole world. And I think it's nice when you have a parent who travels and he would come home and he would bring coins from different places and he made the world feel so big and exciting. And he was always happy to be home, but he loved different experiences. And I think that's really contagious. And certainly in this day and age, I feel like it's, it's very hard to go somewhere where the language barrier would actually uh, make a trip unenjoyable. Yeah. I learned a bit of Dutch when I was living in Holland, but there was never any real need for it. I will say... I just hit my two-year mark in Duolingo All right. on Spanish. But I only do it through the app, so I never converse with anyone, and that's how you'll get better. Do you want to say anything to our, our Colombian uh, listener? Just ask that question. Me, uh, me encanta. Uh, <laughs> I love. Um, that's great. I think du Duolingo will definitely be signing up to sponsor the pod. No, I, like, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how to say like your, your call. Puedo hablar español mejor que... Yeah. That was great. You're being hard on yourself. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> lo siento. Oh, good. Lo siento. Yeah, mucho. lo siento to this whole thing. Uh, can we have our last question, please, Sam? You guys have mentioned the Grand Canyon question in all of the podcasts. So my question to you is, would you do a Grand Canyon podcast where you visit, you go on one of the hikes, and we get to follow along on the trip? It's a really good question, and it's an excellent idea. I'd love to do it. I think that if anyone's going to poo-poo it, it's the guy who says he doesn't want to go. Yeah, I guess my question would be like, is this a situation where you need both? <laughs> Look, I'm going to tell you this. I, 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 I want to be sincere here. I think it's a really good idea, and I think we should do it. I think when there's a time to do it, I personally think it would be really fun if it was just the two of us. But if it was, you know, uh, my whole family as well, then it would be less fun. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, I just think my kids aren't young. Well, you'd be stressed out. You'd be super yeah, yeah, stressed out. Yeah, yeah. And my, uh, my kids aren't old enough for it yet. So, like, I think, yeah, I think the answer is Josh and I find a time and, and we do it. I think we do a special episode. Yeah. At the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Hey, and guess what? Sam just told me. What's that? The Grand Canyon has reached out as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, and they want to give All us. Right. They want to give us a tour. For real? Yeah. Here, I'm going to read. It. Greetings from the large hole in the ground. We've been enjoying your podcast. I'm going to help and notice your recurring question: Do you want to visit the Grand Canyon? We'd like to extend a warm invitation to make that a reality. Your listeners will thank you for the firsthand experience. We'd be happy to give you the VIP tour. Let us know. We will be parked in an unmarked white van. Outside of the airport, please bring all your valuables. This is a scam. This is a scam. Yeah. When you said the Grand Canyon had reached out, I thought we had a voicemail from the Grand Canyon. How do you think it has sound? Josh, do the Grand Canyon's voice. Hey, guys. <laughs> We'd love to have you here at the canyon. And now do uh, the Grand Canyon leaving that same 
message, but using that uh, voice modulator app because he doesn't want the other canyons to know it's him. Let's go. Let's love to have you here on the Grand Canyon. Come by any time. We'll give you the VIP treatment. Well, look, I think at this point, yeah, it's probably likely in the future. And I think that was a great question. And I think it pushes it closer to happening. And then, you know, I think once we go, we'll just have to move on to some other shitty thing that everybody pretends is great. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably how a lot of people feel about Thanksgiving. But, but you know, Thanksgiving is here. You're going to probably be with family, hopefully be with some friends. Maybe it's not perfect, but you've only got so much time to spend with your family, especially if you have, you know, if you live far away from each other. So do your best to enjoy this time because it's not like you're going to get it back. So make it count. Make it good. Enjoy each other. And Pachi, can I say something? Yeah. I'm so thankful you're my brother and I'm so thankful we're doing this podcast together. Same, same. Absolutely. Very grateful. I'm, uh, I feel very, very lucky, very fortunate. And we're very thankful for all of you, our listeners. We hope you have a wonderful holiday. And Grand Canyon sucks. Put your phones down. <laughs> put your phones down. Hang yeah, out with each other. Put your phones down. I mean, uh, you listen to this on, if you're going to listen to Family Trips this weekend, do it, do it on the old record player. <laughs> 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 All right, we love you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving. Twas on a Thanksgiving, took turkey on the go. The juices and the broth, they spilled out on the floor. Next time you drive with turkey, get yourself a deeper pan. In summertime, you're gonna have to sell that minivan. Don't ever trust your children until they've grown up Cause they mightn't always tell you just where they have thrown up Have more mashed potatoes or have another roll But do yourself a favor, skip that green bean casserole If you study overseas and if you want to flex Beware of fancy restaurants on Daddy's Gold MX. Hubris leads to trouble when you feel oh so highbrow. Cause then you might be eating brains of a baby cow. If you roll into Kansas, blow a tire on your RV. A tornado drops down to the ground and then you have to flee. Seek safety in a hotel and then when you go back, be sure to take a picture of that kindly man's butt crack. Turkey in the deep fat fryer meeting his delicious end. But then he gets a visit from a handsome turkey friend. Gets attacked by canines, gets a free night in the shed. Two very different endings for two turkeys who are dead. To all our listeners listening to this little song, thinking it must be over soon, it's gone on so long. You're right, it's done, we've had some fun, and so we tell you true. From everyone at Family Trips, we're thankful for you. Thanks to Airbnb for sponsoring this episode. 